and you know um, a bit about of what you do before we mm -hmm. get to understand how Flown Initiative came to be. So tell us a bit about your background in terms of education, professional background mm -hmm. leading to the uh, Flown Initiative. Um, so I went to school and did psychology. Mm -hmm. So I am a psychologist. By profession. <laughs> <laughs> By profession. Yes. Um, I've been running Flown Initiative for the past six years. Mm -hmm. uh, and we work in the public transport industry, making it more accessible, um, safer and professional, not just for women, but also other vulnerable groups, yeah. looking at children and people with disabilities. Mm. Yeah. Now, you have been uh, running Flown for about six years, as yes. you just mentioned, and you have a background in psychology. Yes. But where did your interest in the public uh, transport industry even come from in the first place? Was it a personal experience or mm -hmm. is just a need that you saw that needed to be addressed? Um, well, my dad always used to tell me, follow your passion and the money uh, will come, mm -hmm. right? And so I think back in my 20s, now I'm 33, I used to look out for what is my passion, yeah. right? And having grown up in a, in a family that ran Matatus, um, I didn't know that at, at that point I saw, I had a different perspective to the Matatu industry. Mm -hmm. And um, it was at there was a point where I got harassed at a public transport terminus mm -hmm. uh, in my hometown. And, and, and I remember thinking, I'm like, okay, I, I love the Matatu industry. I appreciate it, mm -hmm. but there is a problem. Yeah. But it was about two years later that uh, my girlfriends and I were just chatting and we were like, oh yeah, the Matatu industry, what's wrong? And I was like, no, you're misunderstanding it. <laughs> and so we just kept talking about it randomly. And yeah. then one of my um, girlfriends called Faith was like, Naomi, I think this is a job for you. Do you want to make it into a job? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, mm. at first you're like, eh. yeah, I was like, mm, nah. really? Um, and I started doing it as a hobby, like mm -hmm. on the side. Um, at that time, I was working uh, at a local university. Mm -hmm. And I saw this um, lady being stripped in Nyeri. Wow. And I happened to be on leave. And something clicked in me and mm -hmm. I found myself in Nyeri trying to organize a go. protest. I know. I <laughs> so one of my friends was um, and her mom were living in Nyeri. Okay. So I called her up and I'm like, hey, can I just come in Nyeri? Something has happened. And she's like, yes, yes, come. So, come. I, so I spent time with them mm -hmm. and I was like, I think I want to do a protest. And she's like, yes, go for it. And um, on the day of the protest, guess how many people showed up? That was a nationwide campaign. <laughs> you know, it, and if in case you're wondering what it is, it was the My Dress, My yeah. Choice. That came a bit later? Yes, that was a bit later. Okay, this tell was, us a bit about that one first. Um, this was in May 2013. 2013. So, planned a protest. Only four people showed up. Wow. There was more press mm -hmm. than the four of us. Yeah. <clears throat> and... Um, one of the ladies, Anne Kiai, is a lawyer, was like, hey, I think I have an idea. Mm -hmm. And she was like, let's do a press conference. Mm. So we got behind a table and did a press conference yes. instead of a protest. Yeah. Um, and so I, I came back uh, to Nairobi. And again, my friends were like, Naomi, this, the, like, you're really passionate about this. This is a job for yes. you. Um, and so we registered it. And that's when Flown was born. Yes, that's when Flown was born. Now, when you were starting, it's been six years yes. now, uh, what were those specific things that you were hoping to change, to just do away with mm. and have an alternative that is more conducive and more inclusive for everyone? Mm. Yeah. Um, so I think there is a perception that the Matatu industry is chaotic. Mm -hmm. If we could get rid of it, we should. But I don't think we give enough uh, appreciation for the industry and what it's done for yeah. us. Considering we don't have a public transport system. Yeah. We have, Kenya, we have a private public transport system. So imagine if the Matatu industry was completely wiped out, what would happen? Right. Like you know, when they strike, we are literally exactly. left grounded, not knowing what to do, having to walk to work. Yeah, so I, there is a lot of positives with the matter to industry, mm -hmm. but just like any other systems, there are a bit of issues that just need a bit of fixing, mm -hmm. right? For example, um, on average, I say like a matatu industry hires four people, not not the matatu industry, like a matatu itself. A single yes, one. Yes, on minimum hires four people, mm -hmm. right? 
And it's one of those few industry, given a high unemployment rate, where somebody can show up at a stage and mm -hmm. actually go home, right, with something. Having earned something. Yes. Um, but also looking at the customer service aspect of it, right? On average, let's even pick the small uh, Matatu, the 14-seater mm -hmm. one, right, and say on average, uh, per trip is doing 12 passengers, right? On average, let's say they do about 10 trips, right? Five round trips. Mm. That is Squad about... Tano. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> As it is popularly known. Um, that is about... That's them interacting with about 120 people mm. on the minimum. That is some serious customer service, yeah. right? And this is not like a phone call where you call somebody and uh -huh. if they're annoying, you can just hang up. This is 120 physical contact yeah. for almost an hour, right? Wow. Or even more. Mm -hmm. But we don't offer any customer service training, mm -hmm. right? All we do is we tell somebody, we get a driver and a conductor, and we tell them, me, by the end of the day, nataka 5K. How you Please, make it, you yes. do you. You, you do you. Please don't get arrested. Fuel Please don't get into an accident. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I want my money. And then we get really shocked when they do everything they can to get the 5K, mm -hmm. right? With no training, nothing. You're just given a car and you're told to go. No letter 5K. So we as a nation are actually failing ourselves yes. when it comes to the transport industry as it is yeah. because we don't give it as much priority as it deserves and yes. as it needs. Mm -hmm. I mean this is an industry that interacts with more than half of the population yeah. because more than half of the population <coughs> actually use yes. public transport mm -hmm. to commute on a daily. Now just from that do you think especially when it comes to the training bit mm -hmm. because anyone who knows how to drive can just go get registered and can yeah. as long as you have access to a uh, public uh, form of public transport you can get into it mm -hmm. when it comes to the training bit of it what more do you feel needs to be done given that they interact so much with the people because mm -hmm. you know this is a service industry yes. and it's very personal mm -hmm. what more do you feel needs to be done in terms of training especially for our touts and our drivers um, so we do have a program that deals with that. It's mm -hmm. called Dusalama Uma. Mm -hmm. And after five years, we developed a toolkit just to condense all the learnings we've had for the past five years. Yeah. So we do train uh, Matatu Sakos on customer service mm -hmm. and help them develop a customer service charter and sensitize them on uh, street and sexual harassment mm. and help them adopt a sexual harassment policy. And we also look at their internal structures, looking at how they recruit, looking at the benefits they offer their employees. Because one of the issues with the matatu industry is when people get into it, they see it as a transition job. Mm, to something Niki, else. Yes. Just keep you busy. Yes, Niki tu unafanya tu, ukingoja job, right? Mm -hmm. But on minimum, you find that people are there for about three years. There's nothing temporary about this job, mm. right? It's permanent, like you can make it into a profession. So we try to f professionalize the workers who are there by giving them proper benefits, mm -hmm. by advocating for proper co contracts. Um, and so I feel that as um, a nation, we need to look at it as a job and provide the tools to do the job effectively yeah. and also the training. Now, uh, you're also big on a few other things and I just wanted to touch on, you know, when it comes to influencing behavior change yes. and not just on the employees who are in the transport industry, mm -hmm. but also on the customers who use uh, our public service uh, vehicles yes. because we <laughs> all have an attitude towards Matatu. When you see a Matatu speeding, you always say, if you have to be a matatu driver, you need to have some level of, you know, <laughs> not uh, in the normal spectrum. Uh, yeah. But when it comes to behavior change on both sides, you know, both the consumer and the uh, producer of this service, what more do you feel needs to be done? Give us the situation as is yes. and then a possible solution just be conducive um, and inclusive for all. Yeah, first of all, let me say on a personal level, being brought up in a family that ran matatus, the drivers and conductors that people look down upon were people who are like fathers to me. They are fathers to me, mm. right? There are people who took me to school, people who took me to hospital, people who dropped me off to high school, helped me pick a high school. And so I do have a very different perspective of mm -hmm. who the Matatu driver and conductor and uh. Kamagera and stage managers are, mm. right? Kamagera. <laughs> Kamagera, I do. <laughs> yes. Um, so with that in As mind... I drop my book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please go on. Go um, on. With that in mind, um, I do feel that um, there is a need to... Uh, I'm lost, sorry. 
when it comes to changing uh, behavior. Oh yes, both oh. on the consumers, Commuter, uh, uh, the okay. commuters, and of course the employee employees in the transport industry. Uh, okay, so we look at it on three different levels, mm -hmm. right? Looking at working with the transport organization that is Matatu Sacos, yes. right? Putting in place systems. Uh, to support their employees, right? Um, so looking at their HR policies, mm -hmm. do they have any maternity leave? Do they have any benefit, maternity benefits? Most of them do not have. Yeah. Most do not even provide contracts, right? So you will wake up one day, mm -hmm. and you know they do wake up early, like by five they're on the road, yes. right? So you wake up at four, right? Show up on the stage at five, and then you're told, oh, poor Leo, una job Leo, right? Or for, especially for women who work in the industry, that, and most of them are conductors, drivers have to pick conductors, mm. right? And sometimes um, there's an exchange of sexual favors where they're like, you know, give me and then interpret your job, yeah. right? That should not be the case. It should be that there's, there's a gap where people say that we have these vacancies mm -hmm. and make a conscious decision to actually hire women into these positions, okay. right? With our training on customer service, um, with the operators, we have conversations about this is a job mm -hmm. and the matatu is your office, yeah. right? If you are doing an eight to five, would you be working in an office that's dirty, right? Would you be letting thieves get into your office? Mm. You would not. Would you be dressing up for to go to the office? Yes. Would you be taking your job seriously and being on time? Mm -hmm. Yes. Would you be showing up to work being drunk? No, because you know you lose your job. And so we have this uh, conversation, not just on one level, but on uh, various levels. And with our women in transport uh, program, where we work with women in the matatu industry, mm -hmm. um, <coughs> we, look at, we look at doing capacity building for the women, mm -hmm. right? Um, so getting them together, for example, uh, we had a first aid training. Yes. So let's say you're, in the, you're on the road, mm -hmm. there's an accident that happened. Right? As you as a conductor, are you in a position to help while waiting for, for example, an ambulance, mm -hmm. right? The, uh, your car has had an issue, yeah. right? Does that mean you'll not go to work or are you going to look into what the issue is, mm -hmm. fix it and move on, right? Okay. Regardless of what your gender is. Yes. Yeah. Now, in these six years that you have been running Flown Initiative, I'm sure there has been you know, a number of barriers that have been, um, you know, the number of bumps that you have to overcome mm. to just try and bring this initiative to an actual reality and make it a movement that people understand. Let's talk a bit about that and let's start with stakeholders mm. and the ne necessary stakeholders for that matter when it comes to professionalizing the industry, the transport industry. How has that been? And, you know, in terms of the challenges that you have encountered to just bring this sense of professionalism on board with Flown Initiative? Um, yeah, I think when we talk about what we do, the first thing people ask is, is the Matatu industry receptive to your message? Yeah. Yes, they are. Just like any other person that wants to be good at, at their jobs, they mm -hmm. are, right? And the way the system is set up, most people complain about the Matatu industry, mm -hmm. but don't do anything about it, right? So we just highlight the problem with I no know. solution in sight. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and save up for a personal car, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> because it's been shown that Kenyans actually um, spend money, the first thing they spend money on is a car, not even a house, like yeah, a piece of land, right? It's a car. Um, and so we have, um, I keep losing my line of thought. Don't worry, it happens. <laughs> when it comes to it's just professionalizing the industry <laughs> yeah. and you know, it's not being as easy a path as uh, one would expect no, it to be. I think it's been, I would say, it's not as hard pe as people think it is, yeah. right? Uh, for example, in our trainings, we have a minimum of 30 people, mm -hmm. right? We always turn down people. Yeah. Right. Because for us to have the best classes, we, the best uh, number to work with is 30. But there are always people who show up like more than so we the can interest take. is there. The interest is there. Is this the capacity to hold the numbers it's still yes. wanting? Yeah. Okay. And also the, the large scale systems to put this in place. For mm -hmm. example, um, for example, NTSA had the new driving school uh, curriculum. Yeah. Uh, but then you see, like for example, there was no talk of customer service. Uh, there was a one pager on harassment and violence, mm -hmm. right? 
And so we have, uh, we can do better in terms of getting government support to yeah. really push this message mm -hmm. um, and also not consider the Matatu industry as a lost cause. Mm. I see a lot of talk, for example, with a new bus rapid um, system that's coming up mm -hmm. that will not... Um, you know, solve the whole public transport industry. Yeah. The feeder routes will still have uh, matatus. So as much as we want to say, oh no, we, we that should- That will be the solution. No, it will, it will not be. All it right. will not be. And but if we are not careful, the yeah. issues that we see in matatu will seep even into the new bus system. Now you have you have the opportunity to be part of the uh, rapid uh, bus rapid tra transport in uh, Cairo. Yes. You were part of the team that helped to develop mm. it. And maybe if you tell us, you know, how your experience was and, you know, what are some of the solutions that you feel we could borrow even from other countries, not just with this mm. form of transportation, but just the small solution you know they say that uh, the devil is in the details yeah. as here as could we could just also borrow the same statement and saying the solution is in the details maybe what are some of those tips and pointers that you saw from Cairo that you feel could really work here in Kenya in the transport sector um, so first of all I think with Nairobi traffic um, has been quite popular but Cairo traffic is on another level worse you way was wow way was and everybody is beeping <laughs> so they they hoot for everything like they hoot instead of signaling so it's like really really noisy in traffic okay right um and so they do have a metro system mm -hmm. uh, that is very congested that's not accessible for anyone with um living with disability mm. and so this new bus system is supposed to ease that congestion okay. um, and also solve those issues so uh we were brought on board to help them develop the gender plan mm -hmm. right so we had surveys with commuters mm -hmm. so being an islamic country there are not a lot of women in transport industry yeah. there are way we could not find any and the ones we could find were either marketing officials but not transport. actual on no. the road actually on the road no. yeah. okay um so that we had to start from like just basic mm. like do women have driving um licenses mm -hmm. so most women do not have again been an um, islamic country Right, so that was on a different level where we have to say, okay, we need to encourage women to get driving licenses mm -hmm. and we need to scrap out, um, like for example, the requirement to have had your license for five years. So that, yeah. because that means women will get into the industry five years later, later. right? So th we needed to have a really strong affirmative action, mm -hmm. uh, call for affirmative action in Cairo. Um, and also looking at people with disability and we found out that their caregivers are women, mm -hmm. right? Most of them? Yes, 100% of them actually were women. Wow right and having focus group with them and discussing so what are your challenges and they say you know it gets to a point for example with the metro i just have to carry my child on the back and some of these kids are not just small kids they're like 15 year olds mm -hmm. right and saying you know i need to take him to the doctor's appointment i can't use the metro it's the most efficient um <coughs> It's the most affordable. Mm. So for this new bus system, it needs to be accessible. So we had physical features that make it accessible. For, for all? Yes, for all. Mm. Um, and this is not just for people uh, with disability, even the elderly, mm. right? For example, having a platform level boarding, right? Um, talking about having special scholarships for women to get into the transport industry, mm -hmm. right? For example, I'm a psychologist in the transport industry. I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it would, it would have been great, like, for example, in university to, for somebody to have noticed that I have an interest in transport mm -hmm. and actually sponsor that sponsor that because it took a lot of like learning curve to get into the transport industry mm -hmm. as a psychologist. All right. Now, uh, let's talk a bit about, you know, the cycling culture. Mm -hmm. Do you feel mm -hmm. if the cycling culture could be introduced in Kenya, it would, it would actually assist, you know, help ease the transport industry? Um, yes. And even looking at it from a different point of view, looking at uh, climate change and pollution, mm -hmm. right? Cycling and walking are zero emissions modes of transport. And as I talked earlier about uh, the first thing that Kenyans invest in is it's a, a car. personal car, mm -hmm. right? Which is not really sustainable. And we are, for example, when you're in your personal car, you're probably alone, right? Most at of most, the time, yes, yeah. most of the time. And at most, you only have um, 
somebody else, a um, party lift, mm. right? Um, and as opposed to a matatu that can hold like, you know, 14 people going on to 33, so forth, so forth. Yeah. So it's a more efficient use of space, right? And less pollution as compared to public transport. Mm -hmm. So I've also worked on um, promoting cycling for women in Cairo. And we had a focus group and the, the issues that uh, the women cyclists in Cairo face is for example, harassment again, lack of um, infrastructure, which is also an issue here. We yes. don't have cycling lanes, right? Yeah. Uh, but I, as we say in the transport community is that build it and the people will show up, mm -hmm. right? For example, you saw the Kilimani um, roads, right? They have cycling and walking lanes. And you started seeing all of a sudden people started cycling, mm -hmm. exercising. Um, I have one of my friends who's cycling on that road. So I think if we put the infrastructure for it, mm -hmm. make sure it's separated from uh, vehicle traffic, because one of the the reasons why people don't cycle is a safety concern. Safety issues, yeah. yes. But if it's physically separated from the vehicle, you find more people will start cycling, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I do believe that if we put infrastructure in it, people will cycle, right? For example, there is the Critical Mass Nairobi, mm -hmm. which is a monthly event of uh, cyclists. It's been picking up quite, quite really, really well. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just about making it safer for all. Yes. So that you don't have to worry about, me. yeah, I'm just cycling my back and then somebody comes from behind because there isn't proper demarcation as to where mm -hmm. I'm supposed to cycle and where the car gets to, you know, use the road. Now, let's talk a bit about, you know, some of your personal achievements. Now, mm -hmm. 2017, you were named among BBC's 100 inspirational and influential women. What did that even mean for you to be recognized in what you love doing and it's being recognized on such a global scale. Um, I didn't expect it. Really? <laughs> yes, I really didn't. So I, um, <laughs> I met uh, um, the BBC lady and we just had coffee. And she was like, okay, so I'm in town for a couple of days. And I was like, cool. And I thought it would be an interview after. Um, and then I didn't hear back from her and then came the award and I was like, oh, oh wow, that is amazing. Yeah. Um, I think it's been, it's opened doors for, for our work, mm -hmm. right? Because after that, for example, uh, Dar es Salaam won the Sustainable Transport Award for the implementation of the bus rapid transit. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I was one of the speakers at this award and got an opportunity to present to them an award. And that was the first time an African country has won that award. Mm -hmm. And being a Pan-Africanist, I was so excited. Yeah. <laughs> I was so excited to be there and happy that they won the award. Yes. Um, I think it's created more awareness about, again, about our work, um, just like my dress, my dress, my choice did. Yes. Um, I feel that when we were first starting out, um, people will be like, you're too niche, we don't understand. Do you want to expand to like urban cities? And I'm like, no, I think we should focus on public transport because I think it's quite a huge industry, yeah. right? And, the, and as women at that time with my girlfriends, we felt there is a serious need for interventions, yeah. right? But there was no data to back up our work, mm -hmm. right? And then after my dress, my choice, people are like, okay, Naomi, we see what you've been talking about. And I'm like, three years later, really? <laughs> <laughs> my dress, my dress. That was one of the most <laughs> talked about protests uh, that happened on the streets of Nairobi yeah. due to just the harassment that is there in the transport industry. Now, when that protest, let's just touch on it mm. a bit. When it happened, did you get the results that you were hoping to get uh, from being part of this My Dress, My Choice uh, campaign at the forefront for that matter? Um, well, I've been writing a book about that experience, hopefully to be uh, out soon. Um, I think it did achieve far more than we expected, mm. right? Because we were, and, and still are amateurs in planning a protest, right? Mm -hmm. Like we met on a Friday and, uh, <laughs> and then we decided to have the protest on Monday, right? So we had two and a half days to make it work. All systems go, yo, yo, kuja tuende Monday, tunapatona pale. I know. Uh -huh. Nani anenda central police for permits? Nani ya kona loudspeaker? Where are we going to do it? Who's mapping the route, right? Mm -hmm. How are we funding the campaign, right? So we decided, for example, to start selling t-shirts beforehand to fund the campaign, like getting the permits, right? Mm -hmm. um, getting a system, 
right? Um, the social media awareness, right? There was somebody always on social media just tweeting meters here, meters here. Graphic designer volunteering their skills to just get word out there. Yeah. But I think we had already decided that if it's the 13 of us holding placards, it was okay. Thank God it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> Where people actually even took time off from work to show to up for the part protest. Of it. One of the criticism about the project um, was the choice the name choice right mm. because it trivialized the issue where again people thought it was about dressing right and dressing has been used especially in the transport system and the forms of harassment and violence that are experienced there as a scapegoat mm -hmm. right they'll be like ah, I'll come and i'm like that's not the issue that's it's a double-edged sword yes mm. and so th that's one of the criticism of the protest um, and also another criticism of the protest was the sustainability aspect of it, right? Mm -hmm. So we got together, did a protest, and afterwards there was the backlash of nudity is not my choice. Mm. That led to the lady um, Hoka being stripped, uh, I think, some, like a day after the protest, mm. right? And so we were doing a lot of firefighting that we did not have time to think about how do we sustain the campaign and the impact. Mm -hmm. But in terms of results, it was really impressive because there was that uh, anti-stripping. did way better than the first one. <laughs> <laughs> the anti-stripping law that was passed, yeah. right? Um, about a year later, there was the um, Kayole perpetrators who were sentenced to life in, uh, in prison, okay. right? And TSA, that's the time they, they were reviewing their driving school curriculum mm. and had the, <coughs> had the brief on um, sexual harassment. Also in their app, they also included a tab where you can report uh, harassment, harassment in public transport. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have other organizations that came on board to work in uh, public transport. There was research on the industry. Um, and so I think it went beyond what we had expected. It did start a ripple effect of solutions. Yes. And you know, they always say we are a reactive country. <laughs> we tend to wait for something, to, unfortunately, yep. until a crisis or something happens, that is when we tend to look for solutions. But at least this was able to trigger a sense of uh, a chain of solutions for things that have been long standing and still would happen but could be avoided. Mm -hmm. you know, and also, uh, let's just quickly now move on back to your personal achievements. Yes. Now, just last year in 2018, you were also part of the Ashoka. Um, <laughs> we have a program called Ashoka here. Mm -hmm. So the Ashoka's Challenging Norms, a Powering Economies Challenge, you won that. Yes. Tell us what it was about and you know, what it even meant in line with your work. Mm. Um, so at some point about three years uh, ago, mm -hmm. we started um, getting together women working in the transport industry, finding out why are there so few women, what can we do um, in terms of bringing more women uh, into the industry, but also helping the women that are already in the industry with the challenges they're facing. Yeah. And so we developed our Women in Transport program. And now when the Ashoka came in, our pitch was that we need more women into the industry. According to our research, there was less than 1% women in the industry. Mm. And there was even a need to expand uh, our Women in Transport program, not just in Nairobi, but Mombasa, uh, Dar es Salaam, and Kampala, mm -hmm. right? And the, the whole point of the program is, um, well, to get more women on board, um, but also to increase the safety and prof professionalism of the industry by having more women professionals. Mm -hmm. And so with the Ashoka Challenge, our pitch was to expand to Mombasa, uh, Dar es Salaam and Kampala, which we are going to do in the next two years. Okay. And when I was talking to the person who runs the challenge, they said one of the things they liked about our proposal is the fact that we were, un we were in unconventional spaces looking at unconventional partnerships. Mm. And also the fact that we are working in the informal system. Okay. Yeah. Now speaking of partnerships, you know, of course you cannot do this by yourself. The transport industry cuts across the country. Yeah. You can only do as much as you can. Yes. When it comes to partnership, what are some of the avenues that you feel have the potential to just help and especially now bringing in the national government and the county mm -hmm. governments on board to just help professionalize and make this transport industry achieve its potential 
and its level best when it comes to especially employment for so many people and even an inclusive uh, sort of um, avenue for all. Mm -hmm. So part of our mandate is movement building. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have, we organize the annual Women and Transport Africa Conference, mm -hmm. where we bring on board uh, city officials, researchers, and practitioners. Um, because of that same thing you've said about, we realize we cannot be able to do everything. And it's about bringing uh, all these stakeholders together mm -hmm. for about two, three days and talking about the issues, talking about the interventions, talking about the research that's there. And then at the end of this, uh, for example, this year we have it in Addis mm -hmm. and it brings together, to bring together about 150 um, stakeholders in the East African region. And at the end of the three days discussing the action points. Mm -hmm. So at the end of it, for example, um, I know the Nairobi City Council is sending some officials at the end of the conference they have action points and then we'll follow up with them okay. uh, for the next year and then for the next conference they come mm. and report okay. right uh, so we've been working with various stakeholders mm. um, in that way to just try to push um, for more more policies, mm -hmm. more laws, and more interventions, and definitely more research okay. into the area. All right. Now, as I bring the conversation to a close, maybe you could tell us some of the projects that you're currently working on and the available classes that you guys offer for mm. those who are interested to know how to go about, to just know what you need to know about the transport industry. Knowledge, as they say, is always power. Yes. Um, so currently we have our, uh, our Super Wanganya campaign. Mm -hmm. Uh, Super Wanganya. Mm. <laughs> yes, you'll find it on Twitter and um, Instagram and Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, so this is just again highlighting the challenges that women face in the industry and also highlighting the good side of them working in the mm -hmm. industry. And these are stories as told by the women working in the industry. Um, so if you're a woman, right, anywhere you are, you are unemployed or you're mm -hmm. looking for a side hustle, the Matatu industry is right there for you, right? Get in touch with us and be a part of our Super Wanganya, <coughs> Super Wanganya okay. campaign and mm. program. Um, if you're Matatu Sako, right, and you want to increase your bottom line, right, we offer our trainings for free, mm -hmm. right, because we are donor funded. Yeah. Um, and it will take commitment both from management and board because we have the charter and the policies that need to be officially adopted by your circle mm -hmm. and your operators need to go through the training to find out what is in the charter and what is in the policies okay right um and lastly i would talk about we have our toolkit which mm -hmm. is online right and we've been trying to push for government officials to officially adopt it and especially with the new bus rapid transit system yeah. trying to get Namata to adopt it beforehand before the the buses come and the system is up and running. All right. Yeah. Now when it comes to public awareness, what more do you feel we need to do as the commuters to just even help our fellow uh, our fellows who are in the transport industry just make it easier for them mm -hmm. because we are always quick to complain and we don't yes. try to understand what they also go through. They're also human. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to awareness among the commuters, mm -hmm. what, what would you advise the people to just always have at the back of their minds before you start spewing hate and <laughs> negativity just because, you know, you didn't get the best service from one uh, matatu and you need to just start spreading it all over to everyone that you meet? Um, I, I think... The public sometimes brings their stress to the Matatu industry and take it out on our operators, right? And we need to see it just like any other job, just mm -hmm. like you cannot go to the teller and start shouting at the bank teller. That's the same way you should not start shouting, for example, at a conductor, mm -hmm. right? And one of the, um, when we looked at the research and especially for women working in the transport industry, the most prevalent physical violence they experience is actually from commuters, mm -hmm. right? And that's the reason for our Super Anganya um, campaign, because you see, in, like we have a short film, and the short film talks about how the commuters are looking down at the women who are working in this particular um, mm -hmm. matter to in the film. And so what we would say is that it's a job just like any other, mm -hmm. right? Whatever stereotypes you have about uh, Matatu that they're uncool, they're perpetrators, they didn't make it in life, they're all false, 
right? Mm -hmm. With a high unemployment rate, we are lucky we have the matatu industry. Which is thriving. Yes, right. Um, and secondly, when you, when you interact with them, see them as employees, mm -hmm. right? We are here to get a service from point A to B. That's what you should focus on. Mm. And lastly, please, please, please try to come with the exact change. Yeah. The amount of time, the amount of um, work and time, I, like our operators tell us, like it's, it's six in the morning, I want to change. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right? And the transport is 40 bob. Right? I'm about. Yes. So please come with exact change. Okay. Yes. You know, it's just a way of them earning an honest living as you were. And, you know, you would want the same respect when you are at your place of work. So it will only be right to just offer the same to somebody else who is in mm -hmm. the transport industry. And I love it when I see lady touts or drivers. I yes. just feel, you know, it's, <laughs> you're like, yes, you go, girl. You know, it is encouraging to see more women. At least these days we see more women just taking up these mm -hmm. opportunities that are in the transport industry. So let us try and be human, be kind. You know, in as much as you have your own share of stresses, they also do, yeah. So sikujen and negativity, we can expect. Akifanya kitu in a kusirisha, you now go all out. Resume ni njema tuwa matatu, you know. And at the end of the day, you still need them. All right. So thank you so much for coming thank through. You. We absolutely appreciate what you're doing to just try and change our perception about the matatu industry. It is one of the industries that is booming in Kenya, and you know, even Kenya was actually on the global map when it comes to how the matwana culture. Mm. How we are so vibrant with our matatus, matzarungaini z, you know, all that puts us on a global map. So it will be good if we do not be the ones who break it down because of what we don't understand. All right. So seek knowledge, and at the end of the day, we help build each other. Yes. Right. True. Just remind us how guys can find uh, our Flown Initiative on social media and you as well. Um, you can find us on social media at Flown Initiative, F L O N E. Uh, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And you can reach me on Twitter at Nairobi Mwaura 8. All right. There you have it. She is Naomi Mwaura, the founding director of a Flown Initiative, has been at it for six years, just trying to bring um, the beauty that is in the, beauty, in the transport industry. And let us just come on board and help bring this idea that she has been working on for six years to life and keep it going. Now, we want to just uh, call it a discussion on women at the forefront, but we have more interviews coming up in a bit. So we just want to take a very quick breather. We'll be right back with more of Good Morning Kenya. Do let us know where you're watching us from. The hashtag is Good Morning Kenya on Twitter. Our official station handle is at KBC Television. That is on Twitter. My handle is a genuine boy across all social media platforms. On Facebook, our page is KBC Channel 1 TV and our SMS number is 20154. Do stay with us. We'll be right back.